Sir, it is such a pleasure. Thank you for finding the time to do this. Oh, no, thank you for uh, for inviting me. I really appreciate it, Chris. I, I know you have a huge platform, and for you to give me this opportunity to talk about my my platform uh, is a huge honor, so thank you. Are you kidding? You, this is The I, honor I is mine. The I, honor know, is mine. I, know, I know which side of the be- uh, bread is buttered, you know what I mean? Well, I appreciate you, and congrats. Oh, you didn't yeah. know. It's, just, it's like absolutely crushing it. Every time I look at the charts, it's right up there, so, yeah. I mean, that's well, amazing. I, I appreciate that because I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> at all <laughs> it's just it's a wing and a prayer so, how does so, it how does it all come together so so look thank god for the researchers you know what i mean because half the time i don't remember stuff until i read through the through the uh the notes but if they didn't you know they schedule out what we're going to talk about and stuff like that I, I wouldn't even know where to begin so so thank god for the podcast heat crew you know uh they, they they're helping me out along the way a ton so thanks to those guys I mean, you're going to be doing this for, I mean, the, the very foreseeable future. Are there any episodes that are coming up where you're like, oh, man, either I can't wait to talk about that or Ooh, yeah. I'm scared to talk about that. Well, the, the one I was kind of scared to talk about was the VKM one. And not because it was the uh, us being them. It was just a dark time in my in my life, literally. Um, so it was like, eh, do I want to relive that? The one we just did with uh, that I think comes out Thursday. Uh, is with Billy and his kids. And so we had a really good time. We could have gone on forever, but uh, I hope it turns out as, as good as it was fun to do. You know, uh, you, you can have fun doing it sometimes. Uh, and then it sucks as a podcast, just like a wrestling show. You could write a wrestling show and then go, holy mackerel, that was a great show. And you get the ratings and old man Nielsen said, nobody was watching. You know what I mean? And you go, you got to tell yourself, Hey, it was still a great show. We still right. had fun and we still did what, you know, the best, put forward the best product we could yeah you mentioned billy's kids i loved i love billy too and uh yeah. you know austin and colton were recently on the show how much of you and billy do you see in the gun club well i, I do see i do see some and that's kind of weird for me to say and, and weird for me to feel that way but i think it is anyway but but i do see us a little bit i see austin as that that uh, the difference is he can work too. He's an athlete too. Like I could, I wasn't a very good athlete. I, I was just uh, entertaining, I guess. But but both of his kids are really good athletes. It's just like Austin is the is the one that's kind of out there a little more, and uh, Colton just kind of brings home the bacon. You know what I mean? He just does what he needs to do. And so yeah, I do see I see some uh, some things that are similar. You know, and, and I actually worked with them or talked with them a little bit a couple of times now about coming up with something, you know, not, not, it can't be like what, what ours was, that's for sure. But coming up with something that is a sing songy thing, even if it's when you're a heel and it's the old Kurt Angle, you suck thing. You know what I mean? It's something that the fans can interact with. So we're, we're kind of working on that. Well, they've got the ass boys thing going on right now, which, <laughs> you know, whether they like it or not, the fans yeah. love it. I, I look, I think they like it too, if I'm being totally honest with you, because it's something, right? It is something and it's something that the people get behind. And so, but to, to their credit, they sell it. You know what I mean? They sell it because that's what they're supposed to do. If they got along with it, they probably wouldn't chant it. You know what I mean? So, right. so yeah, I think they're doing the right thing. Those kids have got a huge upside and the sky's the limit, man. I'm excited. I'm more excited for Billy to get that opportunity to work with his kids in the ring and all the time and helping them. And, uh, you know, it was just the short time I got to do it with my dad uh, was such a cool moment for me that I'll have for the rest of my life. And so I'm thankful for Billy that he has this opportunity. And those kids have just insane genetics. I mean, look, their dad is a freak. <laughs> he is a freak, bless his heart. He's all man, ain't he? And a yard wide. He, uh, you shake his hand, and, and like I like to watch at these conventions we go to because I'll see guys come in and they like feel like they're the alpha, and then they go to shake his hand, and I'll just look at him and go, "Did he try you?" And Billy will <laughs> say, "No, not a chance," you know. Or yeah, he tried, you know. But Billy squished their hand, man, and just. They literally walk away going, thanks for the autograph. Oh, my God, my hand's killing me. But, yeah, it's that catcher hand, man. And I always say the stiffest part of any match we ever had was the hot tag to him because he was he would work himself into that frenzy. And when that hot tag came, he would dislocate my shoulder sometimes. Uh, but, yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a genetic freak, and those kids are too, back to your original point. What, what genetics they have and what good-looking kids they are too. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. I feel like there's no better name for your podcast than, oh, you didn't know. Like yeah. There, yeah. there must not have been another name on the list, right? Well, the tr truth be told, I had to be told that, you know, I had to be recommended, like suggested, like, hey, it should be called, oh, you didn't know. And I was like, oh, well, I want to call it the dog house or something. You know what I mean? And it was like, no, oh, you didn't know makes perfect sense. And after I got over the, you know, the, the thing where you go, no, my, I want to do my idea. Uh, and then, <laughs> then you're, you cry for a second, like King Baby. And then you go, wow, oh, his idea is better. Um, so yeah, oh, you didn't know. It's a perfect name. When was the first time that you said, oh, you didn't know? And what was the meaning behind it originally? Yeah, so I, I don't remember the date, but I do remember it was a house show and uh, the underfaker, Brian Lee, uh, chains of DOA fame. Uh, he always was a great friend of mine and, and, and uh, we would mess around. And back then it was, you know, you better fax somebody. Oh, you better, you better page somebody. You know, we were saying all kinds of different stuff. And so one night we were messing around backstage right before my match and he came up and, and uh, unbuttoned my, my, my uh tag title and uh and i turned around i was cussing him out and i said when i get back here you know and he's like oh you better call somebody i said oh, okay okay so here i went out out the door and literally the music went bow 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 and i said oh you didn't know <laughs> it, was, it was it was to totally just make him laugh like the one guy that I'd been messing with backstage was totally to make him laugh, but it sounded so decent and it fit so well in between the guitar riffs that I thought the next night, I'm going to do that again. You know, back then we were working 20 nights a week. And so it yeah. was like, I'm going to try that again tomorrow night and see if it was just a one-time thing or whatever. And, you know, the rest is history. Wow. I feel but like there were thing happened, man. We used to just be, you know, stone cold, all that crap was just uh, in the rock and everything just was, it was the timing, man. It was, it was gold. It was the golden era. And so anything and everything caught on, you know, they were chopping people's peepees for a lot of people. <laughs> but I, <laughs> chopping people's peepees. I don't feel like the freedom is there though. If someone came up with something super original now in the, this era that they could get away with it. Yeah. I, look, I, I do think it would have to be run up a, up a totally different flagpole than, than mine was uh, because back then literally our whole gimmick was, just give me a microphone and I'll talk us down to the ring. Well, then they gave us some ring music and we were like, oh, cool, we got music now. You know, back in the day, you didn't, sometimes you didn't have music at all. You just came to the ring. Yeah. And so back, you know, you got some music and you're like, oh, cool. And they were invested in us. And so I heard the music. I did it one time. It stuck and, and the rest is history. And then how did you come up with the, the shtick that would be the thing that you guys said every thing, single week? How did you know yeah. what, what would work? <laughs> so, I mean, I think I stole that from like a Ringling Brothers or, a, or a, you know, a, the, the, when you come to the fair or whatever, the ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all, I just step right up and get, you know, it's just the carnival barker. And so yeah. it was basically that that I just kind of modified to fit me and Billy's names and, the, you know, in the New Age Owls. And then I would just tweak it ever so gently you know what i mean to to say something about the town or to say something about the talent we're about to work with or something where you just modify it each you give them the part the sing song part that they can holler at you you know with you uh but then you just tweak it to make it personalized for that city i guess i feel like you were like right on the edge of being like a freestyle rapper because a lot of your stuff <laughs> a lot of your stuff rhymed you know what? Everything rhymes. And I'd still think of things like that, like to remember stuff. I think about rhymes and I think about, you know, and, and so I'm not a good freestyle rapper. I can tell you that much right now, but I, I do love hip hop. I grew up on hip hop on old rap, you know, Sugar Hill Gang and all that back in the 80s. And, uh, and so I came up on all that. So yeah, I love to rhyme. I loved, you know, I stole the D-O-double-G from the Snoop Dogg and, and uh, it was back in a time when nobody cared. Uh, so, so I don't know, man, we just, I don't know, Chris, we just had such a good time and I was high all the time. So I just did the best I could. <laughs> do you not do, you not, yes. do you not remember a lot of things because you were high? I, I, I honestly think that's probably the case. I, I do remember some stuff and when I start reading about it, I go, oh, I remember that. We did that in such a, and, it, and it'll bring stuff back. But look, I also don't know where where my head's at. You know what I mean? I did a lot of foolish things, a lot of foolish bumps, and a lot of you know crazy chair shots in the head. You know, a lot a lot of crazy stuff. So who can pinpoint uh, what it is that makes me not smart like you fellers? But there's something there. That's for dang sure. <laughs> Was there a moment like where you can pinpoint where you were like, 
I've got to stop this. I've got to turn this around and I've got to like, like get clean, but for real this time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I didn't have a job at the time. I was riding back with my brother from a, uh, a little independent show in like upper Alabama somewhere. We just drove up to the day and drove back and I'd gotten a bunch of pills from the guys there because the guys at the indie show, I'm still the road dog. I'm still a big deal. So they are going to give me everything they got and share it with me and all that. And, and I got hammered and, and I did the show and everything, but then on the ride back, I was, I was really uh, down on myself and on life and I was messed up and I was mad about it. And, and my brother, Scott had just gotten clean and uh, the company had sent him to rehab and paid for it. He said, you know, you can call Ann Russo. Ann Russo at the time was the, in charge of the wellness policy programs. And so I called her the next day. And, uh, and <clears throat> I don't know that at that moment I was ready to quit doing drugs and drinking alcohol because I, mm. I just was trying to like do something, just do anything. And I didn't know what else to do. And I knew. And so I said, yeah, I called her. She sent me, set me right up. Uh, by the 28th day though, I was ready to stop living that way. You know what I mean? And I had been wanting to stop living that way for a while. I didn't know how to get off the roller coaster. Um, and I didn't care for a while there. This is the dark part of the, of the uh, sweet Chrissy V show. Um, I didn't care which handful of pills killed me either. You know what I mean? And the only problem in my mind at that point was, oh, my kids are going to find me dead. You know what I mean? It was, I had got to that point, but Whatever it was, my kids are going to find me. My wife's going to find me. Whatever it was kept me from doing it. And then I got, you know, and then, and then that's where I was when Scotty said, you can go to rehab. Um, yeah, man. And I'm th I thank God and heaven above today that I went that time because I, was, I just went for 28 days. You know, if you're ready to quit living like that, you'll take suggestions and you'll, you'll quit living like that. But you have to be ready. Like yeah. no place is going to get you there. No no other human's going to get you there. You know what I mean? You, you got to get you there. And until you're ready, you're not going to, you're not going to try to change, you know? Yeah. I've heard a lot of people say that like, you can't have someone else sign you into rehab. Like unless you're ready yourself, then oh, nothing's yeah. changing. And that, look, that's just the legalities parts about it, Chris, like the legally signing in. I, I'm talking about the actual work and, and the actual digging in deep to uh, look inward and see why am I, cause mine was all fear-based. My whole deal, and it's crazy to say that people just go, you went out in front of 20,000 people and cut promos and wrestle and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I was terrified. I was, and I got high because of it. And then the second run, this, this last run about eight years ago, so much better. Like, I wish I would have had the youth of my body that I had the wisdom of my mind at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it would have been great and I'd still be doing it probably. Um, but yeah, when I was ready to quit living like that, man. And so I, I continue to this day to, uh, to look inward and, and, and try not to blame things, you know, life happens and it happens to us all. The, it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous, you know what I mean? So it happens to us all. It's not what happens in life that counts. It's what I do in response to it. And so, that's empowering. You know what I mean? It's also yeah. liberating from like, it's almost like re, if I lifted weights, it would be like re-racking the weights at a squat rack and you go, Oh God, I'm not in control of anything. I don't have to be in charge of anything. I just have to control me. It turns out that's a full-time job, but <laughs> it's a job worth fighting for. You know what I yeah. mean? That's where I'm at right now. I mean, and congratulations. Like it's, it's a big step to be able to go. That was who I was and here's who I am now. Yeah. And, and I'm sad to say that's who I was because it's, I say this all the time. It's that's not who my mom and dad raised. You know what I mean? That was not the guy uh, with the uh, moral values and the convictions that, that they taught me. That was somebody else. And I don't like that guy. And I want to drag that guy out in the street, beat the crap out of him. But then I realize, Oh, it's me. I can't do that. So how do I work on me today? You know? Yeah. The first time I interviewed Billy, which was like maybe five years ago, he talked about how like there were a lot of bridges he needed to mend. And like one in, one in particular was with triple H. Was yeah. that the same for you? A hundred percent. Like, look, you in the program of recovery that I follow, uh, there's, there's some, making amends parts to it. And so I had to make that list. Um, and Jim Ross was one, the rock was one for me. The undertaker was one. Uh, these are guys that tried to help me. Um, 
well, Rock didn't try to help me. I was just really mean to him because I was jealous of him and I was, and he was a threat to me uh, because he could do everything I could do, but he looked friggin' great too. You know what I mean? And it was like, yeah. oh, son of a beast thing. You got everything. Uh, and, and at that point in my life, that bothered me. You know what I mean? I was, a, I was afraid of that. He, like I said, he was a threat to me. Um, so I treated him horrible in front of everybody all the time. And, and, and I went to him and he said, thank you. That's nice of you to say. I don't know if he forgives me. That's none of my business. Um, but I had to do it to clean up my side of the street, as we say. And, and Jim Ross, I was treated him horribly too, because he handled all the contractual stuff and Undertaker tried to help me. And I told him, you ain't my daddy. You don't know nothing about me. And you know what I mean? It was just yeah. where I was at the time. And, and, I ain't there no more and I don't ever have to be there again. That's the good yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. What like do you still keep in touch with some of these people that you had to make amends with? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I look at every time I see uh, I still stay in touch with Taker. Every time I see Rock, we we talk and I see him he came to the uh performance center when I was down there and and spoke and watched some matches and stuff and so yeah, we 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 still get along and, uh, and Jim Ross, I haven't spoken to him, uh, but I, well, I saw him in Liverpool at a, a convention we did and spent some time with him. But yeah, I got to talk to him and look, it helps me. It helps me lay my head on my pillow at night. And, and the more I dig into myself and find out what things were my fault, mm. the easier it is to fall asleep at night. Because mm. at the end of my night, I go, Hey God, what did I do wrong today? Or, or what did I, what could I have done better? Or do I owe somebody an apology? that I spoke harshly to my daughter. I, you know what I mean? I yeah. take a bit of an inventory when I lay my head on my pillow at night and 10 times out of 10, if, if I have done something that day, that's the first thing that'll pop into my mind. And I go, I can make that right right now, or I can make that right tomorrow, but I got to yeah. make it right because I can't walk around with it in me. You know what I mean? I gotta yeah. be, I gotta shake it off. I rem like when you mentioned VKM stuff in TNA and I remember watching that and being like, that seems personal. Like the stuff you were saying about Triple H and Shawn Michaels, like it felt personal. It, it was at the time. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. like people change and, and uh, sure. people that say don't, people don't change or are, are wrong, I guess. But, but like, so, excuse me, at that moment in my life, in my career, I would have fought both of them in at the drop of a hat. Wow. I would have fought them both. And I don't even know why looking back, like that's the, that's the, uh, you know, the drug addiction and the alcoholism is very self-centered. It's very self-centered behavior. And that that's, it was all about me. And how come you guys didn't stand up for me and keep me on? And, uh, and you know, I was a liability. I would have fired me too. But at that moment, how dare you? You son of a gun. You know what I mean? Like, I, and so when Vince Russo came aboard and, and said, Hey, you want to do this thing? It was like, I'll do anything you want me to just keep paying me and keep my lights on and keep me in my drug habit. You know what I mean? And that's basically what my whole tenure there was. So when you go back to WWE years later, does Vince ever end up saying anything like that VKM <laughs> thing in TNA? That's interesting. Oh, let me tell you something. Vince never watched an episode of TNA in his in his whole career um, or his whole life. But but Hunter said something to me, uh, and it was in Baltimore, and I'll never forget it. But it was very lighthearted. But he he said, uh, "Hey, dog, what's going on? We just seen each other for the first time." And he was like, "Yeah, come on in." He was in his office, and I went in, and shut the door, and sat down, and he's like. Yeah, so what's this uh, VKM thing? And I was like, oh, dude, man, I'm so sorry. He's like, I'm just kidding, man. Don't worry about it. And that was it. And that was that was wow. it. You know what I mean? I think everybody kind of gets it. In this industry, you go over there and then you just do what they say. And you go over there and you just do what they say. You know what I mean? So yeah. having said that, it was very personal at the time. And that's why I believe VKM TNA was some of my best mic work. Like I did had some really good promos down there that I didn't realize I cut until the podcast. Oh, you didn't know. Uh, came on and we, and we dug back into that, that time of my life. And it was like, Holy crap. I cut some good promos. They gave me some serious mic time down there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it didn't, it didn't make much of a mountain out of it. You know, they did thank God. When you were over there, how close did you guys feel like you were competing with WWE? Like they did go head to head with Raw for, you know, a handful of weeks. For a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I, look, again, I think a lot of people uh, 
that are in the office, maybe in the, you know, the executive vice presidents and vice presidents of stuff is, is really looking at that and going, are we in competition with them or, or can we be in competition with them? I think the people like me and Billy who had been there and been through so was just like, yeah, we're not competing with those guys, but let's just do the best we can. You know what I mean? And maybe if we as VKM can, can yell loud enough over here, they'll look at us and give us some credibility. Of course, they never did that. <laughs> they never did that. And why would you have uh, in retrospect? Why, why would you have done that? It was, it's like the, the winner of the race looking back to see the you know, fourth place runner coming across the finish line. Does it remind you at all, or perhaps the WCW Monday Night Wars, does it remind you at all of what's going on right now with AEW? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, you know, it's 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 different because they're not going head to head with us. So it almost yeah. feels more like a, a like not a war, but like a, a I don't know, like there's another wrestling show on to me. And and I know that probably they are watching their executives and their higher ups, you know, maybe maybe punk and maybe some higher ups or who know about ratings and stuff like that are following and and doing that. But I think for the boys, they just love to have a place to work and work because a lot of them, I know for me, when I first started, I was just young and dumb and had a dream and wanted to chase it. And so I did and chased it right into millions of dollars and then chased, ran right through that and kept going. But it was, you know, I don't think the boys are so in a competition, in a war as the offices are, you know what I mean? Like it, it feels good to go, Oh, they only got such and such as a, as a rating on that. And they, and they had all this big stuff on it. And I'm sure it feels good for them to do the same thing. You know what I mean? But like I said, I think the boys are just happy to be able to get paid for taking bumps, you know? It is funny that we're still talking about ratings now. Cause like people watch TV oh, yeah. so differently. And I get that like ad sales are based on ratings, yeah. but yeah. Just well, because the thing is, Chris, you, you go to the guy, you go to the guy that's the head of USA Network and go, yeah, ratings don't matter. Well, his whole life revolves around ratings, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to tell them that, but it is an archaic that television has changed. It's on demand now. I watch what I want when I want to watch it. I don't watch when you tell me to, you know what I mean? And I yeah. think across the board. And even when, and I've said this before, even when, uh, you give it three to four weeks and check DVRs, holy mackerel, the number's a lot more impressive. You know what I mean? But we don't ever do that. The next day it comes out and you go, oh, there's the number. Well, actually a lot more people watched it. You just don't have those analytics yet. Yeah. And also a lot of people are watching the clips on Twitter or Instagram, oh, yeah. TikTok, you watch YouTube. The whole show on there. <laughs> That's right. Right. And like the clips go up 20 seconds after they happen on TV. So it's like, just because the Nielsen box doesn't say that you watch doesn't mean you didn't watch. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't mean you didn't take in the content, you know, and then look, I, I, I think they were ahead of the ball with the WWE network. Now look, oh, yeah. it, the game changed and they ended up, it was a better gig to sell it, but um, man, he's always been ahead of the curve. So, so I think having all that digital content, people say, Oh, well, how can you have good ratings when you put all the stuff on digital? I think that's the future, man. So you got to get your foot in the door on that stuff right now. And we'll figure out this other stuff once they figure out if the ratings work or not anymore, you know? You've worked so closely with Vince, both as a wrestler and then behind the scenes. And I'm so curious to know, like, what's the biggest lesson that you can take away from your time with him? Man, and, and, and to be totally honest with you, Chris, there's not one, there's a million. And, and that, Look, that's why people say, oh, you're not bitter, man. I got 10 years of life experience flying on that jet, getting in the limos with him, riding and listening and learning. And But one thing he taught me, um, or one thing he said to me one time, uh, and I'll never forget it, but I, but I remember a lot of stuff. He said, uh, I came to him and I said, hey, uh, I forget who it was, a talent. So-and-so wants to say this in their promo. Uh, that's not what we wrote. Are you cool if they say that? And he goes, does it get the same point across? And I said, yes, sir. He just went and he said, yeah, Brian, do that. It empowers the talent and then they'll have more trust in you. And I said, okay. But he told me that on a one-on-one -on -one basis because sometimes he writes your promo and that's what you say. You know what I mean? If they yeah. can't, if he can't fully trust that you're going to go out there live on his television show and do and, and, and act accordingly and, and do your promo in a professional way, he doesn't know if he can trust you yet. So you say it verbatim. I think this was Dolph Ziggler, to be quite honest with you, because it's one of those things where you go, oh, I trust Dolph, and then he shoots himself in the foot. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I do love Dolph. I think he's one of the best bumpers. Oh, I love him. Man. 
I would love to have seen Billy Gunn in his prime and Dolph Ziggler as a tag team. Holy crap, man. Uh, yeah, the Suicide Blondes or something, you know. Yeah. Awesome. What were we talking about, Chris? <laughs> what, learning from Vince. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, look, dude, you sit under that learning tree, and sometimes you sit under it till 3 in the morning, but it was – you, you, you learn stuff and, and it's little stuff about the business and about not just the business about uh like being a professional like being an executive like he mm. he had me going to or he didn't have me going he had somebody coming to the office once a week from carnegie and teaching me like how to be an executive like he wanted to make me an executive and have me work and i, and I it was on me i couldn't handle it um to work with that man is difficult you know what i mean it's not difficult because of how he is it's difficult because of who he is he's a workhorse he will work all night and be the first one up in the morning to work again the next day and one night we got to the town late we flew from from monday night raw to uh to, it was when we were doing smackdown on tuesday we flew to the next town we landed at like two in the morning and, and i'm like we've been there all day and i just can't wait to get in my hotel room bed and so i started to get off the plane he goes brian you got smackdown yes sir I sit down, I pull it out, and we're going over. And I said, sir, to be honest with you, I'd really love to talk about this in the morning. He threw it back in my lap and said, you're going to regret that. And I, <laughs> I caught it, and I looked over at Kevin Dunn, and I said, oh, God, I immediately regret saying that. And Kevin said, you should. And then from the next morning, he called me early. I had to go up to his room, and we went over the show. And I was like, oh, but I'd, I'd gotten some sleep then, so it didn't matter. But, like, he is a workhorse, man. And I couldn't keep up with him. I, I couldn't keep up with him. And that's, and that's the truth. That's all there was to it. I went to him and said, hey, I feel like I'm losing my serenity. My sobriety might be. Like, I'm white-knuckling my sobriety right now because I'm just – on call all the time and right you know everything's uh you know my whole life was smackdown it was smackdown yeah. and that's that's how you have to be in the wwe you're you're married to it and so it got hard you know and i couldn't hang and so i went to nxt where i thought i could skate for a little while and i did but then they needed for business decisions to trim some fat and, and look I've, it's no secret i've gotten fat so they, they cut they cut me and 14 other people and, and it was a business strategy thing look i called him and i said hey thank you you know what I mean? Because not only did he pay me for 10 years and give me 10 years of, of quality life experiences, um, he sent me to rehab for free and saved my life. <laughs> and he did the same for my brother. You know what I mean? Like what, yeah. if you're bitter at that guy, uh, something's wrong with you. And that's, that's, again, going back to the sobriety thing, that's what I'm trying to figure out. When is something wrong with me? And can I fix that? You know what I mean? And so- I don't know. He's a great, he's a great leader. He's a leader of men. That is for sure. And I've been around some in the military, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, you know, I've been, been around Colin Powell and Vince McMahon is a leader of men. No two ways about it. Men follow him, men fear him, but the same way, uh, fear is used when people say, I fear God. It's just a reference, right? It's like, a, I'm not comparing him to God. I know he does yeah. that all the time. Uh, another funny story. We hit some turbulence one time and I said, Oh, God, please protect us. And Vince said, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> he would say stuff like that. It just made me, it made me laugh, but it would scare me more because I thought we were going down. What did he see in you as a wrestler that he made, that made him go, you'd be great working in the office? Well, so, so look, I, to be quite honest, he didn't see anything in me. I, I know he, oh, hey, Lou. I know he did as a, as a, a wrestler back in the day. He obviously saw something in me. Sure, he yeah. in Billy. Um, but Hunter went to him and he had to go to him three times and say, look, I'd like to bring Brian James back. And he said, why? He's a known drug addict. Why would you do that? And, and that is a totally legitimate point. And he said, well, he's been sober about a year now. And, uh, and, and what was great was right around that same time, uh, I inducted my father into the hall of fame. And so I got to walk out on the empty floor before they set it up and Kevin and, and Vince were standing there and I got to walk up to him and shake his hand and say, thank you for this. This means a lot to me and my family. And so looking people in the eye, uh, with clear eyes and with, uh, you know, clear thoughts, helped me a ton he finally said okay paul but this was on you when he mm -hmm. grabs the bed this is on you um i came in and i was just on like a six week or a three month period or something like a trial period as a producer 
um, I produced for a little while. And then I, then we had some backstage stuff that I helped produce some fighting backstage and, and, and somebody told him like, Hey, dog's good at this stuff. And, uh, so all of a sudden they said, Hey, what do you think about being on the writing team? And I thought, Oh, okay. So I was, then I joined the writing team. Well, then I started going to the office every, every week. And I would go Monday, Tuesday TVs, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, at the office Friday morning, fly home. You know what I mean? Still, still emailing and, and texting about the show all weekend, but, but fly home and be home for Saturday, leave again Sunday and do Monday, Tuesday. You know what I mean? So it, that way yeah. for eight years like it was it was a task um never got to see my kids much my family much but but i loved what i was doing it just got to be too much for me man yeah do you still keep in touch with hunter the old man tapped me out do you still keep in touch with hunter how's how's his health doing yeah so so he well he texted me on my birthday uh and and so we texted back and forth a bit on that day i've kind of tried to let him have his space uh because i i know when i had my deal I didn't want everybody bothering me. So I haven't bothered him. He reached out to me on my birthday. I'm appreciative of that. I'll see where it goes from here. Um, he's always had my back. He's always been my friend um, on a, on a different level because for the past decade, he's been my boss too. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a different relationship because I almost feel like it's fraternization. Excuse me. When we're just shooting the breeze, you know what I mean? I feel sure. like we're, you got to get him at the right time to, to, so he can be Hunter, your friend, because yeah. believe you me, he's Hunter, the, the, uh, the second in charge, the rest of his life, you know? Yeah. I've always wondered, Brian, what's the tattoo on the back of your head? So it was <laughs> the story behind it's better than the, than the tattoo itself. Uh, <laughs> the tattoo is like a cow skull and the, the horns are like sewn to my, to my skull. And then it has like, you know, like almost like a, uh, an Indian dream catcher has like feathers hanging from the horns and stuff. So I went to, this is a true story. And I hope if you have children watching, don't, don't do drugs, children. I, I was working in Memphis and I was driving to Jonesboro, Arkansas to work with Jerry Lawler. I just gotten there. I got back from Germany. So I was working the main event with Lawler. It's just a spot show that wasn't TV or nothing. I went to the tattoo artist because he was also the guy that I got my weed from. Uh, turns out he had more than just weed. And we went on into the night with tattooing of heads and, and uh, missing of shows. And the next day I showed up to TV in Memphis and I told Jerry Lawler I was sick. And he said, yeah, you must have broke out with a tattoo on the back of your head. Oh, <laughs> said, man. Oh, crap. I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry. He's like, yeah, they told me about you or something. You know what I mean? King, King was good. King was very cool to me always. Uh, but but that's how it got there. Look, it's I could grow it up. I, I could grow it over, you know, with hair. But then I don't know what my hair, my hair so naturally curly. I think it would look like an afro. But that might be cool. It might be coming back. You know, you know I think you could pull it off. I know I could. It would look like Will Will Ferrell from uh, the basketball. Game. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, yeah. What was that? Oh man, Why? we're gonna get everyone in the comments is gonna be like, I can't believe you don't know the name of that movie. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, I'm gonna look it up here. And his semi the, semi pro. There we go. Semi pro. And the name of his character uh, it was something don't, funny too. Look, I'm don't worry. Making, the internet knows everything. <laughs> just I'm just making myself look stupid at this point. Now the, the the internet knows all, so we will uh, figure this out. Uh, well, we'll we'll get to this, I guess. In a uh, Jackie Moon, Jackie Moon, Jackie Moon, <laughs> man, the internet it knows everything. It knows let, me ask, let me ask you this: Wasn't there also a Jackie Moon that was the little koala in the movie Sing? <laughs> Well, now we got to figure this out. Jeez. And I, I don't know who did the voice of the little koala, but the Sing franchise, they're friggin' great. Uh, they <laughs> are. Watch them, I would say to watch them. Buster Moon. Buster Moon. Ah, that's right. Man, the, inter the, the internet is undefeated. It's they unbelievable. Are. They are. Some clever people on there, too. I feel like with everything you accomplished in WWE, that the door is probably open for you to go back there eventually. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that. And I, and I would love that. Uh, but I, I would also be at this stage in my life and knowing what I know now and going forward, I don't know if I could take that. You know what I mean? Mm. Not that if I could, is if I want to, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, you're married to the company. 
and I've, and I've been married to the company for the last decade. And I know it's only been a few months since I've got released, but it sure has felt good. Uh, Nick Patrick, the referee said it best when he said, man, it felt like I got out of prison when they cut me. And I thought, <laughs> He's right. It did feel like that, like a weight off your shoulders. But then it felt like that for two reasons. The second one being, holy crap, what do I do now? <laughs> you know what sure. I mean? And I'm not a felon. I'm an ex wrestler. What do I, <laughs> what do I do now? It's about the same. But the thing is like when you're going a mile a minute all the time for 10 years and it yeah. comes to a screeching halt, I mean, what, what do you, what do you do? Yeah. Well, look, I, Thank goodness I have uh, 10 acres of pastured property. I raise miniature goats and, and I have miniature what? pigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, and I, and I just bought two new puppies that, that are uh, sheep or goat dog, like goat protection dogs. So we're raising them up and training them to protect the goats. And it's just, look, it's just fun to get out. I love, I'm a John Deere guy. I love cutting grass. It's my happy place. Uh, I like to cut grass out in one of the far pastures and like look over my property and just be thankful. You know what I mean? Like this is mine. And now I got to figure out how to keep it. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like so you I'm and Brock have a lot to talk about. Bringing me back. Uh, now's a good time. Or I could do color commentary at, at AEW. I could also do the promos backstage. This, this is like a job interview, I feel. Chris, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch, Brian. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank yeah, thank you. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> I feel like with the GOAT talk, you and Brock Lesnar would have a lot in common. Oh, oh, yeah, we probably could. He'd probably want to eat my goats on one of his. You know, he's got like seven green eggs, those green egg uh, things. He's got like them the all the barbecue things. Yeah, yeah. He has them all over his property. So no matter where he goes, he can like grill a dead animal if he wants to. <laughs> like that's a man. That's an alpha man. <laughs> He just wears their fur as <laughs> through the winter. <laughs> when people bring up the idea of DX and NWO and want to compare the two, what, what do you say to that? Well, look, I get the comparison. I, I think they came at the same time. I just think one of them looked to me, and of course I'm biased because I was in one. I just thought we were kind of cool because we were distinct and that was us. I felt like they added people every chance they got and split into different, you know what I mean? It was like, I, I liked it when it was just Hogan and, and, uh, and the outsiders, you know what I yeah. mean? It was like, Oh, but then all of a sudden there's now Bischoff and now Buff Bagwell and now, and now Dennis Ford Rodman. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dennis Rodman, like missed a practice to go or missed a game or something to go and wear an NWO shirt. I just felt like it got kind of bastardized and I felt like DX is kind of, Solid. I realized we traded us out for Shawn Michaels, but then Shawn got added back in when we got removed. So I felt like, I don't know. I just felt like we were cooler. Sorry. <laughs> whose idea, whose idea was it to bring you and Billy in originally? Yeah, well, so what, who we heard it from was Hunter and Shawn. And, and at what, since I've dug back into this, it's been, and I, I haven't called Sean to ask him yet. I've just been uh, specu speculating. Um, this was about the time Sean was going away to get back surgery. And so my, my, again, my speculation is he was going to go, they had just gotten a really good start. Um, and, and what do you do now? It's just Hunter in China. And that's a cool package, but it's not as cool as, you know, so they saw we were, we were climbing at the time and we were climbing quickly. You know what I mean? That's what, if you go back in time, you realize from the time they put us together, me and Billy to the time we joined DX was about three months. I mean, it was, it was record fast. And yeah. I didn't realize that till I dug back in and sort of watched. I was like, Holy mackerel. They put us and they put us right with DX and we were the tag tight, you know, tight title holders, members of degeneration X. And we were on top of the world man. and it was, it was awesome for me. Yeah. And that like you guys being thrown together is one thing and, you know, getting over, but then being thrown into DX like catapults you. Yeah. Well, look, it was also, you got to give credit where credit's due. And I know a lot of the talent uh, doesn't like to do this, but the writers and the bookers, they, they're the ones that booked us in a position to where it wouldn't make us look out of uh, like fish out of water. If they put mm -hmm. us with DX, they had four months, three months to really put a rocket on us. And they did that. We came in and we started beating every tag team, beating them up, shaving their head, taking their shoulder pads, taking their cowboy hats. I mean, we basically uh, just annihilated the whole tag team division and, and kind of joked on them too. And they wrote that in for us. You know what I mean? So yeah. 
it was it wasn't hard to get over when you're on TV in such a positive light so many weeks in a row. You know what I mean? But you you had so many gimmicks leading up to that point. Did you <laughs> think that the New Age Outlaws would be the gimmick? No, heavens no. I just knew the roadie, excuse me, the real Double J wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> and Billy knew Rockabilly wasn't going anywhere. And to be totally honest, we both said, put us together. We have good chemistry not knowing or having a clue how it was going to turn out. But we did have good chemistry. We did have good timing together. We did have good, I don't know how to say it other than like uh, communication without words. You know what I mean? Like I know where to be when he's going to do something and he knows where to be vice versa. So it was just, the chemistry was there. Then we just had to get in there and see. And we were totally opposites too. That's one thing I loved is we were doing, uh, we we're totally not bookends. We were, I was, you know, a skinny guy with uh, braids and stuff. And he was this Jack dude who was a great athlete. And so he went to the gym all the time. I never went to the gym. He liked to look good. I like to feel good. Uh, and so, so we were totally opposites and that's maybe part of the key to the success, you know? And I, I mean, I see it every time I've seen you at a convention. Oh, yeah. Fans still eat like they eat this up like nostalgia may be the most powerful drug, Brian. Uh, man, it, it is. And it look, it's good for me, too, because it feels really good to stand there and go, man, there's a line for these 55 and older guys. You know what I mean? Uh, who, who wrestled before some of these people in line were born. You know what I mean? But they got the new action figure. They got the new whatever. And they're coming to get their stuff signed and have that experience. And look, that's what me and Billy, when we started doing these conventions, we had literally ate dinner one night. And I said, hey, I want our experience to be, I said, people are paying for the experience. And, and right now they're paying crazy to, to me, but, but they are paying it. I want to give them an experience they walk away from and don't ever forget. So mm. it's, what do we do? How do we do that? And he's, Billy's just like, let's just be us, man. Let's just have fun. And let's and look, I have my TD Jake's towel because I'm sweating to death, but I'm working and I'm inter- I'm trying to be entertaining and I'm trying to mess with Bill. You know, and it's just, I want people to walk away from us going, oh my God, those guys were so much fun. And I don't know. Um, so we try to make, we call it the new age outlaw experience. Uh- <laughs> You're definitely the loudest table in the room. That's for yes. sure. Yes, usually uh, because of me or Austin is at the table next to us, Austin and Colt. Uh, But yes, I'm definitely the loudest guy in the room. Uh, But that's by design. You know what I mean? I want you to know I'm there. I like the sound of my voice. Well, the thing is, you're an 11 out of 10 on the energy scale. And then Billy's an 11 out of 10. So put you guys (laughs) together. Yeah. Oh, man. He's so he's so great. I just spent uh, this past weekend with him and Paula and uh, his wife, for those of you who don't know, uh, in Jacksonville. We did that Jacksonville. We just went in there on our own because we didn't have anybody taking us. We just got some tables. We did really well. But, but more than that, it's just great to hang out with them, man, and go went out to eat with uh, Colton and, and just just great friends, man. Like I said, we look, we weren't great friends when we first teamed up. We really weren't because we were so opposite. But then we kind of, when I say grew up together, I mean, we both got sober. You know what I mean? We both got out of hand and then we both got right, right around the same time. And so we've grown up together, man. And for the last 11 years for me, uh, 10 and a half for him, maybe 11 for him too, at this point, tell you the truth. Uh, we're brothers. We're literally like brothers. Like I'm closer with him than I am with my brothers right now, you know? Uh, and of course it's because I spend a lot of time with him, but it's, I can tell him anything. You can tell me anything. It's a, you know, it's, we're, it's a love dude. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's not weird at all. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I love that you guys have the trademark for new age outlaws. Like that just oh, yeah. feels like, just feels like WWE just dropped, dropped the ball there and you picked it up. I, yeah. Look, I think DX is probably their bigger, uh, commodity. Um, but yeah, me too. I was surprised by that as well. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if that if that works out for us. You own it now. Yeah, yeah, it's ours now. What are we gonna do? I mean, even though you're not working there, you're still getting royalty checks from w, from WWE for DX stuff, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, and and also That's I'm on good. a I signed a Legends deal, so I that I can still excuse me. They can still do stuff with me. I you know I still get the royalties, everything. So yeah, yeah, I. I I wanted to keep my relationship with them really good. Even if I went to somewhere else to work, which 
you know, I, like I said earlier, I'd love to do that. I'd love to work with promo guys backstage at AEW because it's just new talent. Well, half of them's an XT talent I've worked with in the past, but but uh, I would love to. It's a new challenge, something challenging. You know what I mean? Well, you've got a good friend that works there. I'm sure you can make some calls. <laughs> I do. I do. Daniel Bryan is a good friend of mine. That's who I was <laughs> referring to. Yeah. I think his name's Brian Danielson anyway. Yeah. That's in my Obviously so we're not too good of friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you been backstage there yet? I have not. I have not been there at all. I was, I was looking forward to the opportunity in Vegas, uh, but I ended up canceling my show out there. So I didn't end up going, but I was looking forward to and just kind of meeting everybody. And like I said, I know all the producers and know, but, but there's a lot of talent there that I don't know that I'd love to, I'd love to try to help out. You know what I mean? I just don't have much else. It's either, Hey, let me tell you how to cut this promo or do you want fries with that shake? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just those just, are my two options. I don't know. I'm sure you're making enough goat money at all these signings. There, there, there is, uh, there is some money being transferred on these signings, uh, and and thank goodness. I'm also still under severance with uh, WWE, so when that stops, I'll really get scared. But but I think uh, with the podcast and uh, the Oh You Didn't Know podcast, I don't know if you knew I had a podcast. Chris, I didn't know. But, uh, oh you did, Oh you did know. That's My ass better call somebody. Yes, you called someone. But uh, I forgot what we were talking about again because I tried to get a gratuitous plug. That's good. In. We can bring it back around full circle to how we started the conversation, which is, oh, you didn't know. <laughs> Perfectly. That works perfect. Yep. Yeah, I don't know what we were talking about. It's cool, though. I'm just Let's just hang out for a minute. That's what we're doing. This is great. No, I've... <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed this, Brian. Like I, I have too, Chris. And like I said at the beginning, I don't know if I said it on the air. I do appreciate you having me on because uh, ho hopefully my my podcast will grow in a way that I uh, don't have to lose weight and take bumps. Um, <laughs> but and you giving me this opportunity is appreciated, dude. I just want to say thank you. Well, the pleasure is mine, and I'm so glad I was able to spend some time with you and hear your story. And like, I appreciate yeah. you being so open and honest. And I think yeah. that well, look, I don't know how else to be. I'm an open book, and you can you can like it or you can not like it. But that's me. And it's one thing I've learned in my sobriety: it's none of my business what y'all think about me. <laughs> you know what that. I mean? I'll try to do the best I can and be the best I can. I can't control what you think about me. I'll just do me. You know what I mean? And that's I what I'm wanna, doing now. I'm loving it. I, I love this. And I just want to acknowledge you because there's going to be a lot of people that are listening to this who may be struggling in their own life and yeah. hearing you open up about this, maybe will make them turn their life around. Well, look, there's a, like, oh, I know I'm just saying the podcast now and I can't get around it. Uh, but I talk a lot about my anxieties because look, I have a ton of anxieties. Billy does as well. And we often talk about it uh, to each other and see, that's the kind of, I got somebody, you know what I mean? I got somebody I can talk to. I got somebody that will be my sounding board and will call me on my bull crap too. You know what I mean? Not just tell me, oh yeah, Brian, you're good. Uh, no, dude, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't have done that, whatever. And I got, you should always ask for help. It's been big in our society that asking for help makes a man look weak and it couldn't be any uh, further from the truth. It's actually uh, shows the, the, the strength of a man who can reach out and say, I can't do this on my own. I need help. Um, yeah. I'd suggest that's where you start, man. Ask for help. Yeah. Look, I end every conversation talking about gratitude because it's such an important thing to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I start and end every day saying out loud three things I'm grateful for. So Brian, for you, what are three things that you're grateful for in your life? Oh man. I look, family and friends, of course, is, is one. Uh, the health of my children and grandchildren is definitely one. And then look, my sobriety. Uh, is definitely one I'm thankful for. If I get right down to it, there's not much more important than the things I just listed. And if I overthink it, I get outside my hula hoop and I don't belong out there. You know, does that make sense? You know what I mean? That is the best analogy. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I got to keep it tight. I got to keep my circle tight. I got to keep my thought processes only on my priorities. I can dance around and do some other things but what's the most important thing and don't ever forget that and and i forgot it for 42 years of my life i'm never going to forget it again yeah i love that and what a great way to end so brian thank you again and wherever people are listening to this right now they can listen to oh you didn't know could you say it you know the, the way you're supposed to say it oh you didn't know i said that again on the panel the other day and like they were like you still got it and i was like it's not that hard to, i didn't lose it anywhere <laughs> right. Just but yeah, words. I, I appreciate it chris thank you so much for this appreciate you